Hi, Misha here. And uh, trying to do a little bit of revisiting it with the Japanese, if not new. Decided to, to grab the Type 2 Paratroopers rifle and talk about a couple of a uh, couple of things about shooting old guns and about uh, how some people are human whatnot so this will be an episode of story time kind of revisiting a cool unique rifle from World War II and some personal accounts well for those who are not in the know the Type 2 is a takedown version of the Type 99 short rifle. It has the same 25 and some change, nearly 26 inch barrel. It can take, it has the same bayonet lug, so it can take the Type 30 bayonet, although they did also have a uh, shortened Type 2 bayonet for it. Same front sight, cleaning rod. It's a little bit shorter because of the takedown nature. Full length handguard. These never had a monopod, just a barrel band. It does have the split barrel band. These do have the AA sights. At least up until the last production ones. Receiver, of course, is a little different for being a takedown. May or may not have a dust cover, just kind of depends what, when, and where, and why. Butt stock is nearly standard, but the rear swivel has this little ovular inlet above it for making it easier to grasp and flip. Standard metal butt plate. And it's otherwise your standard 99 action. Last round hold open, chambered for 7.7 .7 by 58, Japanese. Standard safety. Standard hinged floor plate. Typical military trigger. Japan always had a thing for carbines, and after paratroopers started to become prevalent, work began quite early to make one. It was initially, initially known as the Type Zero, and it was a takedown rifle, but it used interrupted threads. It also had an unscrewable, unremovable unremo uh, uh, cocking handle for maximum compactness. Well, the removable cocking handle was a huge fail point for oh so many reasons. And the interrupted thread system wasn't as strong as it needed to be. Now there was another version known as the Type 1 for 1941 that was actually a Type 38 carbine that essentially had its buttstock cut back here and a hinge installed so it folded to the side. So they had a side folding version in 6.5. Buyer beware, there are a lot of fake Type 1s out there, or reproductions if you want to be generous. But the version that really went into service in full production was the Type 2 here in 1942. And this uses a wedge system. You unscrew this, rotate, 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 it's got a screw, then the wedge kind of comes out. It is captive, so you don't have to worry about losing it. And then you just pull your action apart. Here we have the complete barrel with a bit of an insert. This is where the wedge locks it through. It's also a pin down here. Of course, we have this metal coupler. And the other part is roughly the same length. You see, there's your receiver. There's the pin. Here's our wedge, you can see it in there. Kind of screws in, grenade style. And the ring does fold, so it's out of the way. 
And this is what worked for them. It was simple and durable. It only had two pieces, so not really much to get lost in the field. And between 1942 and 1944, give or take, they would build roughly, guys, goes together quite quickly. And you just screw your thing down, dog it down good, hand tied only, and then fold it over. There you go. They would produce between 21,000, which I feel is low because I've seen cereals over that, and 24,000, which might be a tad high. So not a huge number, but I mean, how many other takedown rifles were used in World War II? These were also a popular bring back for soldiers because of, uh, well, it was weird and unique and different. Sometimes you will find them matching. There will be ass assembly numbers on both sections, also serial numbers. So there's two different sets of numbers that match up. Other times you'll find, you know, the back half of one made into the front half of another. So, stories. First off, I have this because of, gen of a generosity of a really nice guy. Years ago, I was helping him do some things, sell some things, and um, this was one of the nicest type twos that he had. He he had six or seven, and I you know I just offhand mentioned that I'd I'd love to have it, but of course I was going to put it up on Gun Broker for him because it did bring good money for him, and he said, no, 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 you keep it. Pay me whatever you think it's worth. And I said, no, I, I can't do that. Maybe I'll keep, you know, the second best one if you want, and I'll pay you for that. But he's like, no, if you want it. And I called the mutual friend to see, if, you know, what he thought. And he goes, yeah, if he's offering, you should do it. I mean, he's serious. He won't regret it. You know, it's not a thing to him. So what we settled on, he told me to sell my existing one, the Type 2 that I had at the time. And whatever it sold for, just give him that money for this one. The thing is, that one was not as nice of a condition and it wasn't all matching and it did not have an intact mum like this one does. So in every way this was an improvement but when I was sure he was sure that's what we did and thanks to the generosity of someone I ended up with quite a nice Type 2 a few years ago. Probably a nicer one than I thought I would get because these are getting a little on the pricey side especially for decent shape today. So years later, I'm still much obliged. As far as shooting, I would not shoot this gun. Not because it's unsafe. It's probably as safe as any Arasaka, frankly, or close to it. But because why? I've never understood the point of shooting truly collectible guns like this. Because if something went wrong, maybe even the gun's fine, but maybe you have a bad cartridge. Maybe something just, you know, fluke happens. But what, what if you blew out the barrel? What if you cracked the stock? What if you you just broke a virtually irreplaceable part? Now, if it was a one-of-a-kind gun, for some people, that might be worth it. But the thing is, this thing shoots the same as any other mid-war Type 99. So if you want the experience of shooting a 7.7, just grab any number of type 99s out there that cost a few hundred dollars and, and go to town. I, I, I definitely believe that pretty much every gun I own is sh in shootable condition. I think that's great to have shootable guns. I'm not a big fan of just true, true wall hangers that are not safe to shoot. I more or less like to know that my guns are in that good condition that they could be shot. But as far as shooting truly, truly unique pieces, Nah. Now I could see shooting, say, a Type 97 sniper rifle just to see how accurate it was. That that makes sense to me because that's a different experience. But if you had two Type 97s, one that was a super rare variant and one that was a more common variant, I would definitely shoot the common one and leave the rare one alone. That's just how I personally view Milserp. I'm not afraid to shoot it in general. 
But when I just, when I have something that's particularly rare and that I know that I can't get replacement parts for, and knowing my luck, how things break and go wrong for us, I, I just, I would feel sick to my stomach. It's just not, and even every time I pulled the trigger, I'd worry something went wrong. So for me personally, the worry outweighs what reward there might be from shooting it. Plus, as I've said in other videos, good grief, Arasaka ammo, 6.5 or 7.7 is so expensive. But yeah, just revisiting the Type 2, telling a little bit of my personal opinions in the story. Cool guns. Uh, <laughs> you probably don't see too many in the stores these days. They, they used to pop up back in the day occasionally, but I think they've all been snapped up by collectors now. And there's really not much in the way of variations aside from the having the AA sights or not. And also, of course, ones made in 1944 won't be as finely machined or blued or whatnot as ones made in 1942. But these are all wartime guns, so you won't find one with pre-war quality of blowing. But yeah, just thought we would visit this. Figured why not. I was picking up another gun, setting it down. This was next to it, and I thought, eh, hadn't had it out in a while. Anyway, if you've got some interesting Japanese guns are kind of the jewels of your collection. We'd love to talk about it in the comments below. If you could like, share, and subscribe. And also, if you'd like to help support the channel, please check out the link to our Patreon page. This is Misha, and we'll catch you very soon next time.